Hi there, this is part 2 of repairing and upgrading this vintage Dayton 1030A true RMS meter. In the first video I showed a repair which really boiled down to fixing a shortened tantalum cup and replacing all tantalum and electrolytic cups just in case. I also upgraded the display by adding one extra digit on the right. This was easy because the meter was already prepared for that and all I had to solder in was two chips, eight resistors and a seven segment display. And while the original meter was already running very hot, the 100 milliamps or so for the extra digit really raised the 5 volt power supply temperature so high that I did not want to run it for any length of time with the lid closed. This video starts where I looked into this problem to find out what could be done. The 5 volt power supply is conventional. The AC from the transformer goes through a full bridge rectifier rated for 100 volts and 1.5 amps, is then smoothed by a big 4700 microfarad capacitor and feeds a 7805 regulator to produce 5 volts. It's a bit tricky to see, but the raw voltage across the big smoothing cap is about 9.1 volts. There's quite some ripple in the 9.1 volts, but that is to be expected. But the ripple doesn't make it into the 5 volt rail, because even with the low points of the ripple, the input voltage to the regulator is always higher than the minimum 7 volts needed for it to work and have no dropouts. The only easy way to get a rough idea about the current is to use a clamp meter across one of the AC lines from the transformer to the rectifier. Wow, around 1.2 amps. No wonder this is running hot. The regulator has to convert 9.1 volts minus 5 volts, that is 4.1 volts, at 1.2 amps into heat, that is 5 watts. The regulator isn't the only thing getting very hot. This is the underside of the PCB and the charred part is where the rectifier sits. I want to be clear that this was already so before I started adding the digit. It may be rated for 1.5 amps, but this rectifier is tiny and getting way too hot. And worse, heating everything else in the neighborhood, in particular the large smoothing capacitor. So I decided to replace it. I also desoldered the AC wires from the transformer and added two long wires in to feed DC directly to the smoothing capacitor in the interim. Later these wires will connect to the new rectifier. The new rectifier may be an overkill. It's that big square lying between the meters in this test. The left meter shows the DC voltage and the right the DC current. It looks like both DC voltage and DC current are quite a bit lower. This industrial rectifier probably has a higher drop than the one before and maybe the mains voltage was lower. More about the current later. To reduce the power dissipation on a regulator, I tried to lower its input voltage further by inserting a 0.33 ohm resistor in series. With about 1 amp current, that should drop 0.33 volts. While the 1030A worked, the 5 volt rail now shows a ripple, which disappears when I bridge the 0.33 ohm resistor. So, without massively increasing the smoothing cap to reduce ripple, this trick doesn't work here because the input voltage to the regulator is pretty much as low as it's possible without replacing the regulator with a more modern low drop variant. Even the big new rectifier gets quite warm after a while. So I decided to mount it directly on a convenient spot on the rear panel which serves as a heatsink. That is easy because the rectifier's metal housing is electrically isolated from the diodes inside. This is the completed modification. The rectifier sits on the rear panel, I extended the transformer wires to get the AC to the new position and the DC is fed to the place where the original rectifier was. With the new rectifier in place, I decided to establish a benchmark for the DC current draw, because I needed some way to establish if the next mods go into the right direction of lowering the current. That current was jumping all over the place as the min-max values show. My first thought was that this may be an effect of mains voltage fluctuations, so I decided to measure the rectified DC voltage which was 8.61 volts and feed that as a constant voltage into the regulator for my bench power supply instead. But it made no difference. The max min values are of course reset for this, but the current is jumping around as before. Obviously the 1030A is doing various things internally and so the current changes all the time. Normally I complain that the hold function on multimeters is kind of useless, 
but here it is needed. Actually, I was looking for the hold circuit in the manual anyway, because I wanted to check the integration period, which can only be done when the meter is in hold mode. Unfortunately, there isn't a hold button and the BCD remote control option that has hold is not included in my meter. In this case, they want you to put the meter in hold by messing up this nice edge connector and solder a bridge between a pin on the top and the bottom. I looked at the schematics and found that instead of that, all I had to do is pull R45 down to ground. This is how that looks and it works great. By doing this, I found the current is steady in hold mode, but the value depends on what digits are frozen on the non-multiplex 1030A display, which makes sense. And before moving on, while the meter is on hold, I adjusted the integration period to 20 milliseconds as the UK uses 50Hz mains. By making the integration period equal to or multiple of the mains frequency, the AD conversion is less affected by mains noise. By the way, this is how that signal looks when hold is removed and the 1030A is running normal. Because the current draw is so dependent on what's shown on the display, I decided to standardize on the display showing .0000 in the 1 volt range, which is almost all segments on and it's easy to achieve by shortening the input. With the meter and hold mode, that results in a pretty steady current of 1.0036 amps average, which is my benchmark. So what's the point of all this? Well, given its vintage, the 1030A uses chips from the 80s. Good old plain 74XX chips like that BCD counter 7490 on the left, which I removed from the meter. But there are more modern versions of the same chips that are less power hungry, like the chip in the middle, which is also a pin compatible BCD counter, but one of the 74LS family. LS standing for low power Schottky technology. LS is actually rather old itself and more efficient chips are for example that 74HC00, a quad NAND gate on the right. HC is high speed CMOS and uses way less power than the LS family, but it can't work reliably together with standard or LS chips. There are HCT chips which can work with LS chips, but I don't have any of these, but quite a number of LS. So my cunning plan is to swap out the existing chips with LS versions and see if that makes a difference in current draw. I first tried the four 7490 BCD counters and that already brought the consumption down a fair bit from just over one amp. Next, I tried the three 7474 dual edge triggered flip flops which got it below 0.9 amps. Encouraged, I replaced seven 7400 quad NANs and three 7475 4-bit latches which dropped it to 0.76 amps. I stopped there because I did not have LS variants of the other chips and I did not want to touch the display drivers anyway. They need to provide fairly high currents so LS is probably not going to work anyway. But 17 out of 27 TTL chips is not bad and I am very happy to see an almost 25% reduction in current. After about 1.5 hours of running with the lid closed, I measured the temperatures. The capacitor is around 31 degrees. The shield of the integrator about 37. The regulator heatsink about 33. The transformer about 37. And the rear wall next to my rectifier about 30. I'm quite happy with these temperatures. So far that problem is solved. Onwards with calibration? Not so fast. While trying calibration, I noticed a strange behavior on the display, like what I captured here. This is just on the threshold between 0.9999 and 1.0000, and sometimes the last digit stays at 0 instead of going to 9. Something is definitely wrong. Another problem, just when I thought it was smooth sailing from here, I decided to take a break and publish this part before trying to muster the energy to find out. So stay tuned. If you like my videos, don't forget to subscribe and it would be great if you decide becoming a Patreon. That would really help this channel. The link is in the description. As Patreon, you always get early access to videos, a blog and other exclusive content. Thanks for watching.